Hello and welcome to Nikon Sessions. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about landscape photography. I'm joined by four incredible photographers. Let's start off with some introductions. Just tell me about yourself and what you do. So my name is Angelica. Um, I am a Swiss landscape photographer, originally from Sweden and France. Um, and I mostly focus on composite and astrophotography. I'm Neil. Um, I work for uh, Nikon. I run Nikon School. Um, I've been a landscape photographer my entire life, pretty much. I am so fascinated by landscapes um, and actually all forms of photography, but landscapes are really my passion. Sure. My name is Kim. I'm an outdoor photographer based in Scotland, and my primarily passion really is photographing seascapes, mm -hmm. but I'll do pretty much anything outdoors. My name is Ross Hardinot. I'm a landscape photographer from Cornwall, and um, yeah, just got a great passion for the landscape and, and outdoors. I think we're a really great, diverse group here, and um, I think we do shoot landscapes all slightly differently, and we all have our own reasons for shooting landscapes as well. So a really good opening question for me really is, what is landscape photography to you, and what does it mean to you, and why you shoot landscapes? So for me, landscape photography is mostly the honest and creative um, expression mm -hmm. um, of a landscape that you have in front of you, but it's also how you interpret it. So for me, it's really honest and, and uh, creative expression um, yeah. of mm -hmm. oneself. Cool. I think for me, it's just getting out there, being in nature, um, and just, it's so amazing when we're out there, we were know, walking up mountains, we're hiking down valleys, and then being able to take that shot and record that shot, and that moment you were in, in, in that position. I'm very much the same, it's about being out there, enjoying the moment, really connecting with the world around you and nature, and I just love watching the light change and just connecting with everything, so not just the broader landscape, but also the tiny, more intricate details within it. It's just an amazing experience. Yeah. yeah. Guys, I said it all really. I mean, that, that's, yeah, exactly how, how I feel as well. It's that connection with nature, it's, it's breathing space, it's the opportunity to be creative as well and, and, and yeah, just, just the outdoors. It's just, yeah. a, you know, just a fantastic experience, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I suppose a lot of you there mentioned being out in the indoors, just exploring all those places. Yeah. Do you think that then there's that risk that the weather might be against you? Or is it that your right time, right place, is that a thing? Or is it that there's a bit more research into that? For me, it's a lot of preparation. So I spend, you know, weeks, months sometimes planning a shot um, and I carefully see you know, the position of the stars, mm -hmm. what weather I would need, what is the sun's position also to get a sunset or a sunrise. So for me, weather can go against me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get the surprise you know, of having a cloud that suddenly um, lights up, and that's the, the beauty um, of you know, the ephemeral when you're, when you're there. Um, but the weather is something that I really try to monitor uh, as close as possible because it's, it plays against the vision that I initially have um, of the a place that I would like to capture. I, I couldn't agree more. A lot of planning in shots. Um, I've got three or four apps for sunrise, sunset, moonset. <laughs> I've got Same. four or five apps for weather conditions. I, I, I don't really leave home without putting some planning work in, but I generally have plan A shot. I'll then have a plan B shot if the weather's going to go against me. There's a plan C shot. It's funny, I'd say I'm totally different. I'm a very much intuitive, spur of the moment style photographer and I think that's partly because I mostly shoot in my local area. So uh, I used to travel a lot around Scotland and photograph different landscapes but I often found that I'd go away on these trips and not get very good images even if I'd planned the time of day and the location. So I tend to kind of sit at home and I kind of watch what's happening out in my garden and then just think tonight could be a good opportunity and I just go out and if I don't get good light I'm not that kind of deterred by it, I'll then do some more, more maybe intimate landscapes or um, something more creative like intentional camera movements. I think there's an element where, you know, you're talking about planning, but you can also plan too much. I think that, you know, I think as, as landscape photography now, you, you know, you can obsess about being at a location at a certain tide or a certain condition or time of year. And then there's the risk your images become repetitive or the same as other people's. But there's always a different shot, isn't there? Mm -hmm. and, and as you say, because the, the, the kind of conditions are changing all the time, every opportunity is unique. And as photographers, we have that kind of lack of control. You know, it is what nature provides and we just have to, to kind of work with that. I produce also very few images per year um, because it's a lot of planning, um, it's a lot of you know, understanding the location, but in the end it's also a lot of um, understanding how you put the elements back together because I really enjoy the composite part um, and for mm -hmm. me it's one of the most satisfying part. Spending hours behind the computer um, is where the creativ creativity kicks in and because you do not have any control you know, over the weather um, and over the conditions, this is the only kind of part where you control the image and you give also that final touch which makes every image different even if you, you you know, um, have people 
uh, shooting the same locations over and over again. This is also the editing and post-processing part that um, makes an image come out the way mm. it is for a specific pho photographer. Are we shooting reality? Are we trying yeah. to reflect what's in front of us? Or are we actually we're just punching the colours a bit more, adding a little bit more contrast? Mm. Or And I think that how we finish mm. images is, is our style to yeah. photographers. I, myself, I don't set out to shoot reality. I want my, the colours to be a, just a little bit poppier, the contrast to be just just a little bit more enhanced. So not an unreal sort of shot, but yeah, um, yeah something that people look at and go, wow, that was an amazing sunrise, sunset. It's so subjective, isn't yeah. it? And, and I think uh, the bottom line is, as a photographer, you've got to produce something which is faithful to, to your style. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I personally love going out and just capturing an image just in, in one frame. That moment, you know, that, that moment of transient light or, mm. you, you know, uh, in, 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 one, in one file, I, I love that. And I believe the most important part also of it is it, to be transparent in the process. Um, I have found a lot of um, arguments and also comments, you know, going um, against composite photography. Uh, but it's also because we see a lot of um, photographers that use these techniques and not yeah. disclaiming it. Yeah. And the yeah, fact yeah. that you have that lack of transparency yeah. when you're actually doing yeah. it and not disclaiming it uh, brings a lot of um, bad comments and yeah. a bad vision about what right. it is. Yeah. But if you are not here to you know, express reality the way it is and you clearly explain and then can basically enjoy it for what it is. I think it's really important what you mentioned there about um, being clear on composites versus single images because especially for beginner landscape photographers yes. it can be difficult to tell what mm. is achievable in one image and what isn't achievable in one image right so i think it's incredibly important if you're shooting a a, a well shot location yeah. or a very popular <clears throat> location would you prefer to go to a location that's been shot lots before but you want to do something a bit different or would you prefer to go and try and find your own location almost kind of try and go on your own adventure mm. if that makes sense so yeah talk to me about how you'd feel about that I mean, for, for, for me, it's a bit of both, really. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's always nice to produce something which is original, you know, and that's, as photographers, that's what we want to do. But equally, if you've not been to those places before, you want that experience for yourself as a photographer, I think, and, and to mm -hmm. understand that landscape. And yeah, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't put me off. No. I mean, it's nice to produce something original, but equally, I'm quite comfortable shooting yeah. something. And I think they're both, they both have their challenges. Yeah. You know, it's going to the same location that has been shot over and over again is a challenge to come up with something that Definitely. is new or yeah. at least unique in some aspects. Yeah. And the same is to find somewhere that hasn't been photographed, but that, that has, you know, the same visual potential as the places that have been already shot over mm. and over again is also an equally a difficult challenge to, to solve. It's about, kind of, like you said there, about the experience. Like, you go to these locations to have the mm. experience, to see them. Yeah. I think a lot of people, especially when they get into photography, they want to see these places. I mean, they're iconic for a reason. You know, you're, you increase your chances often of getting interesting images by going to iconic locations. It's funny, in my own journey, when I began, I went to all these lo iconic locations and I enjoyed the experience, but there was always something missing for me. It was like, I'm seeing these landscapes that I've seen photographed so many times and I just didn't feel a connection to them. Mm. Whereas when I went to locations that weren't very well known and I was photographing them in you know, different times of day and different lights and moods, that was when things really came for me. We go to some of these iconic locations and enjoy the experience of being there, seeing it, as you say. Um, but yeah, I think there's a bit of, yeah, I've done the shot, but I've done my version of the That's shot right. with my yeah. edit, so it becomes my image yeah. and as long as I enjoy that process, yeah. that's fine. But again, Absolutely. it's becoming harder and harder, I think, to find unique places yeah, to yeah. go. And I think putting composites makes it but, unique as well. Yeah. So yeah, you get a completely unique image there. The traditional landscape photographer is tripod, lots of gear, all that type of stuff, right? But I think more so now than ever, really good landscape shots of you don't need to always have all that gear with you. Mm. You don't need to have those tripods with you. And you know, the traditional kind of um, medium format film. What do you think your approach is to landscape photography? Are you more of a setup on a tripod, filters, or is it more of a um, handheld snapshot of something that's happening in the distance? What do you think your process would be? Because I think we're all different here. So mm. I definitely notice I'm changing over time. Like when I began photography, I kind of always had my my tripod, my camera, my filters. Uh, very kind of regimented, but I've definitely started to move away from that a little bit more. Um, when I'm shooting in kind of difficult light conditions and, and dark light and stuff, I'll always have my tripod and everything. And if I'm trying to frame up something very specific, I'll have everything on a tripod. But equally, I just love going out now with just my camera around my neck, mm. like kind of the old school kind of stuff. 
um, and just reacting. Um, so for me now, I'm finding it's more of a 50-50 process. It's funny, I think I went the other way around. I started with the camera <laughs> on the neck, you know, just going in the mountains, like, oh, it's nice, it's not too complicated and not too difficult. And the more I learned about what I liked and what I wanted to do in the process, the more I needed gear. The more I needed to, to bring bigger lenses, to have um, more cameras also, because one may be doing star trailing and then you don't have it available for anything else. Um, and I also need everything to sleep um, in the different locations because I, I don't do day shooting. No. So it went the opposite. Yeah, I'm still quite old school. I, I kind of very much a kind of a tripod filters mm -hmm. user myself. And I think there's times when it's uh, obviously now with cameras, you know, you can shoot handheld and up the ISO and, and, and react and, and I still do that to some degree and sometimes I'll do that before I get a tripod out because I think it's very easy to kind of get your tripod out and find you're just stuck in one place yes. and, and miss better compositions so I think you know sh shooting with the freedom of, of being handheld to, to kind of locate your composition and then perhaps using a tripod then to refine it works quite well for me personally. I started old school because I started shooting film, yeah. slides yeah, even same. and that was very much big tripod camera, four stack filters because we had to do all the colour in camera at the time and all that, that sort of stuff. Post processing wasn't really there to do that but as the technology changes and the dynamic range improves in the cameras mm. and things like that, I'm almost at a point now where gradient filters are just, they're, I'm probably going to yeah, retire them. I'm doing a lot more deep space astrophotography, Lovely. so that is by, the, by its nature, and that's carrying the star tracker, yeah, exactly. second tripod to do time lapses while you're shooting the stills. So yeah, somewhere between the two, mm. but I am evolving the way I'm shooting, and that's mainly down to what technologies are available yeah. in the camera. I think that's often one of the hardest things that's to convey to somebody. So we often get that question of, oh, in this in this location, what filter would I use? Mm. And actually, it's, well, what do you want to do with the clouds? What do you want to do with the foreground? And um, I kind of had a very similar approach to my landscape photography to you, which is that I used to shoot handheld and take quick snapshots, mm. and I've kind of moved then into tripod and filter-based, and I, I formed an incredibly bad addiction to really long exposures. So <laughs> um, I, I really like the idea of movement in clouds. So I will choose the filter based on how much movement I yeah. want in clouds and mm. what's going on around me. So that doesn't mean that there's just one perfect filter for every situation. Mm. That can be really hard to convey to somebody sometimes because they think that, oh, if I use that filter there, it also makes what sense yeah. over there. But actually, there might be a couple of different reasons yeah. why you're switching and changing that because not everything suits a long exposure and not everything suits a shorter exposure. There's always difference between yeah. that as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. are you short exposure, long exposure, stacked, all that type of stuff? So um, do you favor that kind of movement an emotion that you get from moving water and moving clouds or do you prefer to kind of capture the scene as it is? I change depending on the, the location and the weather so I tend to arrive on a location I'll have all my filters in my car and I'll kind of say how do I feel today you know like if it's if it's a really stormy day, for instance, I'll tend to do much quicker images because I want to capture that action. But if it's sort of somewhere in between where it's not like flat cam, nice reflections, but it's not exciting mm. stormy weather, I'll, I'll often favour long exposures so you can really smooth out everything and give you a really nice, tranquil, serene image. So, yeah, I literally will just respond to whatever's happening around me. There's no formula to, to landscape photography. I think, I think people obviously would love there to be some kind of format, but there's not. And you just have to kind of react to whatever mm. the weather's doing. And, and, and your own mood and your kind of emotional connection with the landscape at that particular time. I mean, I'm, I'm like you, a sucker for long exposures yeah. <laughs> um, and, and love it. And, and again, I know it's a very kind of cliched technique, but I think in the right situation, it's very effective. But I think, I think the key is not to, to, to kind of get into a habit of mm -hmm. doing one thing just because you like it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of looking at the landscape, evaluating it, deciding what you want to get from it, and then picking the right filters and technique to suit that moment. Very similar to my approach as well. There's the, we'll look at the scene, and mm -hmm. then, yeah, might be a 1.2 grad, because I want to make it dark and stormy. Mm -hmm. Might be a 10 stop today, it might be a three stop. I think I, I'm mesmerized by uh, moving water, and I always mm -hmm. try and have, I, I just, that's, that draws me. And if I see moving water, I tend to have to photograph it. Yeah. And whether it's a coastal shot, or a waterfall, or a, a stream, or something like that, but again, is, do I do it 10 stop? Do I do it three stop? Mm. Let's do both of them, let's do yeah. six. Um, and yeah, well, you do yeah, 
often with your 15. Can't go long enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't go long enough. Sort of, uh, yeah, we'll leave Rishi there for a couple of hours yeah. and we'll come back. And uh, yeah. he's still... Just say, once you've invested There's time. no right or wrong. No. Yeah. And once you've invested time into the composition, which is the hardest yeah. part, if you're unsure which movement's going to work best, then just, just shoot it in different ways. Yeah. yeah. I try to mix both. I try... And I like also to bring both together in an image. Um, so sometimes I would do the sky or running water um, as a long exposure, but the landscape or the mountains, I want it to be super clear, super sharp, or same with the stars, should be mm. very clear, or it should be a star trail. Mm. So I like to mix both into an image so that you have both you know, the stillness and the sharpness, as well as the movement and the flow in one image that you usually would not guess with a single shot. Question for you, and I always like this question because it tells me a lot about you and what you see as your photography. So. Um, would you say that you are an artist or a photographer? <laughs> it's really funny. Like, I've always really struggled with the word photographer. Like people say, what do you do for a living? I, I, I really struggle to say I'm a photographer. So I'd probably go more down the artistic route. And I think now that I'm doing a lot of things like intentional camera movement and multiple exposures and looking at textures and stuff, I, I do see photography for me personally in my work as like an artistry because I'm looking at the light, the colours, I'm learning so much about colour right now and how colour has different emotions and how it plays into the imagery and I use photography kind of as a medium to connect with that nature and create these more artistic pieces but that's just something that I'm kind of dabbling in and going into just now. It's, I think in photography it's a constant stream of and covering yourself and developing yourself and I think we go in and out of these phases don't we of being really technical photographers but then more kind of emotive artistry photographers doing long exposures the light the color editing for instance you know editing is a very creative artistic process in many ways even though it's also technical no I see, I see myself as a photographer <laughs> very much yeah I do I've been doing this for a long long time and, and I had a passion for photography and cameras from the age of 10 or 11 and, and, you know, obviously it's a very creative process, but I kind of, I always credit nature, you know, nature does the hard bit for, yeah. for me and I'm just recording it. So I see myself very much as a, as a photographer, I think, and, and just the ability to hopefully record that beauty and yeah, convey, convey that in my images. I think it's a great question. Um, I think you evolve, you change. Um, I, know, I definitely, when I started on film and slides, very much photographer. The more I got into developing my style as a photographer, my way of editing, um, it's not about photographing reality. Uh, the more we do, uh, the more I do astrophotography and things like that, because of the nature of what you've got to do and you can't see it with your eyes, that mm. means you're moving more into this artistic sort of expression of what you're actually putting, uh, putting up on your social media feeds or um, we're, we're printing, like we have all these great prints here. I think you said it all. Uh, for me it's the same. I, I, I believe I'm a photographer at core um, and I started with this when I was 10 years old um, and I've always loved you know, playing with cameras and, and, and using my dad's past cameras as well. And the more I evolved towards composite photography and line photography, the more it became artistic mm -hmm. in a sense because it's not representing and documenting reality per se. Mm -hmm. But I think photography has become for me more a tool to achieve a vision than uh, uh, being an actual photographer. So it's a mix of both. Uh, I don't know exactly where I am in the, in the spectrum. So if you want to talk me through how you shot this image, what work went into it, and how you came to this kind of final picture, really. Yeah, um, so that image is actually me going back to a location a year uh, later. Um, the first one that you can see here was a, a year previous. Um, and I had a very, very bad experience going there. Um, we had very clear conditions and so on, but we started having terrible winds. Um, that made it very difficult not only to spend the night but also to go back home um, the, the morning after. Um, it was a bit of a difficult time for me yeah. um, and I wanted to go back and bury it and <laughs> do it again. Do it again but you know with one year experience um, and more learnings and safer also in the mountains and you know I, I really enjoy having portrait format um, of my images but I wanted to more and more go into the landscape format to be able to tell a story and have two images in one. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to start, you know, dividing and, and having different stories within the same frame. Um, and so I went back and the cave didn't look as good um, a year after. So it was, uh, you know, a little bit disappointing also getting there. Um, but at some point I was like, okay, you know what, I have two entries and I'm starting going to just see a panorama how it looks like. Because it was at night, um, I started playing with the lights, um, lightening the cave and so on. And then at some point when I was trying to lighten up the cave with the head, um, because it was a long exposure, it did, it did a light painting 
um, and so you have that um, light over the head. There was just me actually um, going around. <laughs> so that was actually a fortunate mistake. Okay, so if you want to talk me through the process of this shot, how you captured it and how you came to this final result. Uh, this is one of my favorite places to go and shoot. It's Vesterhorn uh, in Iceland, and it looks different every single time you go, um, whether it's weeks apart or morning or afternoon. The ice had actually melted where the, 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 the front reflection there is where the sea comes in and then it pulls back and if it's cold enough, it will freeze. But you see this reflection shot and I've managed over the, the few years to get broken reflections. But if you walked out to the right point, you could get this mm -hmm. classic reflection. Okay. So this one was very much, the sun's coming out behind me and to sort of turn around, sometimes the best shot is behind you. And that was waiting for the light to hit the mountain. And then just as the sun came up into the cloud bank, it got a bit diffused. Mm -hmm. And we got this beautiful pastel shades come through. And it was just there and nature did the work for us. And all I had to do was make sure it was the right time, composition right, take the shot. Um, and that made, nature made that very, very easy to do. And it was, um, I, it's one of my favorite shots that I've, I've ever taken. Okay, Kim, if you want to talk me through this shot, the process, and how you came to this final image. Yes, yeah, so this was photographed at one of my favourite beaches in my local area, and the beach is quite famous for beach huts. There's some really iconic groins, you've got old wooden steps and a bay, and that's what everybody photographs. Uh, but I wanted to try and get something a little bit different, which is one of the, the perks, I think, of photographing locally and knowing a, a location uh, really well. So I walked quite far to the other side of the beach, which is somewhere that people never go to do photography. And I walked up quite a high sand dune, and I used a lens that went up to 400 millimetres and zoomed all the way back down the beach to the other side. I got this really nice compressed shot here um, of this lone person just walking um, along the beach there. Uh, with some kind of quite well-known war defences going kind of in front there that's left over from, from the war. Um, but it was the light for this, this image that, that really made it for me. We had this gorgeous shard of light coming down and the Murray Firth where I live, um, it overlooks the, the, the highlands on the other side. So you can just make out some of the, the hills and the mountains on the other side of the sea there. Low tide, obviously, beautiful shards of light coming through. And it was just about kind of compressing the scene and trying to get a different perspective. Okay, Russ, if you want to talk me through this image, the process, and how you ended up with this final picture. So, so the reason why I picked this picture is purely because it was one of those shots that actually were, was, was very, very fortunate. We, mm. We've kind of talked about planning and, and, and perseverance and preparation and all of those things. Um, this was an image which was the result of um, the fact that my baby boy had recently been born and um, he woke me up early and I was meant to be going to Dorset and I couldn't get back to sleep. I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to go now and I'll make, make that journey early and just kind of possibly pop into this location uh, near Brid Bridport um, and, and, and just see whether there was a shot there, there was some mist forecast. But it was almost one of those kind of like, if it happens, it does, yeah. if it doesn't, you know, just on, on my, my, my journey. And the conditions were just amazing. First time I'd been there, um, kind of everything you'd want. And um, yeah, ju just the result of, of, of luck, which I guess to some degree is a big part of all photography. Yeah. You know, you can, you can plan to a, to a certain element, but, but then you've just got to get lucky as well. And um, yeah, beautiful conditions the long lens kind of compressed perspective and I love cool tones so I see that in a lot of my my images I definitely have a preference to making things kind of cooler and yeah. slightly more tranquil and um, yeah it was it was a, a, a really good way to start the day. So Rishi we've done a lot of landscape photography together yeah. talk us through uh, one of your favorite images. Yeah so this is shot on Bamber Beach that's Bamber Castle in this image and um, you, I'm pretty sure you were stood next to me when I took this picture. Um, this is a really good example of the of why I shoot long exposures. The key thing for me is that yes there's obviously foreground water but the, a short exposure would have blurred the waves. It, the longer exposure here is just to get this real nice texture and movement in the clouds. Um, so this is around about 300 seconds of exposure. I'm using a 10-stop filter to be able to achieve that. So the, the colours and the tones that we're able to get on this beach at sunrise at this time of year is just truly fantastic. And in my mind, that kind of thought process is if I shoot that long exposure, I'm just catching that light as it captures the underside of the clouds over that movement and over that long exposure. So like we've been talking about, I think it's down to the preference and just thinking about what you want from that image, whether it's a single handheld shot, whether that's that longer exposure shot. Uh, it's also quite minimalistic in the fact that we just have that castle off to that right hand side. It's very much rule of thirds. 
the sky is the kind of dominant area and that kind of leads into what I mentioned previously about how I really want that cloud and that movement of cloud to be the story behind the image. Mm. Um, and for me, it just kind of brings together a really nice sunrise shot. Okay, if we had a new landscape photographer, somebody that's just starting out in landscape photography, what would be that one tip that you would say to them to help them on that journey as they're starting out in landscape photography? What tip would you give them? Oh, that's a good question, practice. isn't it? For me, the key is practicing. Um, yeah, yeah. Because practicing allows you to understand what you like, mm -hmm. to understand the process of actually creating an image, taking an image. And you know it might be as simple as starting with a phone. Um, and then seeing if you enjoy the process of capturing the moments and then moving maybe towards a camera and or, or different types of camera depending on what you like. But for me, practice is really the basics and the fundamentals mm -hmm. to start getting into photography um, and understanding the, that medium. Mm -hmm. mm. For me, I just say to people always, you know, why did you get into photography in the first place? Because obviously the technical aspect is so important and the creative aspect is important. But thinking about why did you begin photography in the first place? If you never leave that why, then your images always are something that you're going to have a connection to and you're going to enjoy. So although that's not really a technical exactly, you know, thing to, to say to people, it's like never lose that because yeah. that's that's your essence as a photographer. Why did you start it? Yeah. And just always have that in the back of your mind. I think patience is a really important thing. I think I think we live in an age now where, where we want results instantly all the time. Yeah. We want we want great shots and you know it's a new hobby and, and you know I kind of want to get to that point as quickly as possible. But you know, I don't think there's any way of fast tracking it. I think you just have to be, as you say, practice and you, you're patient and you persevere. Um, and, and the reality is all these 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 images the result of multiple visits and you know, that, that determination that you've got, you've got a vision for a shot and you, you often have to go back again and again, mm. don't you, to, to, to get that, that image. And there's no perfect shot at the end of it anyway, but, but I think, yeah, patience and, and perseverance, I think, are really key. I think that those are all really, really great points. I think I would add is um, understanding what you're trying to treat. What, what, mm. what do you want to get out of being a landscape photographer? Do you want to do great composites? Do you want to shoot reality? Do you want to be somewhere in between? But understanding where this journey is going to go, because if you don't have that end point of mm. what your style is, you can't make that journey. Yeah. So actually yeah, having yeah. a clear understanding of what do you want to do, yeah. that enables you to start that journey yeah. and get towards that destination. Yeah, being faithful to your own vision yeah. and, and, and style again, isn't it? Yeah. And that always starts with a why. Why do you do it? Why yeah. do you like mm -hmm. it? And yeah. then you start learning. And the learning curve is also huge in the beginning. Huh? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's very satisf satisf um, satisfying to see that. But uh, the why, I, I think, is a very, very fair point. Mm, I think people get so wrapped up sometimes, don't they, in learning the photography. They're like, this is how I should do it. This is what I'm being told to do. Yeah. And they lose their why. And then a few years later, they start losing their love for yeah. photography because they've forgotten that why. Yeah. Why, why are you doing it? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Just never it's so lose true. That. It's so important, I think. Yeah, yeah I agree. Well. Thank you all so much. I think we've had some really interesting discussions there and we've talked about some really cool topics and looked at some really good pictures, so thank you all so much. Thank you for those of you that are watching at home. If you've enjoyed this episode of Nikon Sessions, please do think about subscribing to the Nikon Europe YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with new Nikon Sessions episodes. Thank you very much.